always remind ourselves why we exist, why we are doing what we're doing, and what we are trying to accomplish. So please, everyone take notes, because you're going to learn a lot of things personally this morning to help you with your own life and through your own passage of time on the earth, the power of vision. If you don't have any notebook to write on, please turn to Malachi, and there's a blank page between Matthew and Malachi. I want you to use that as your notepad and write notes. The power of vision. We're going to be focusing on understanding the nature and the discipline of vision. Understanding the nature and the discipline of vision. A story is told by the president of World Vision, Mr. Ted Engerston, about a man who took his little daughter on a cruise. And the little girl, never been on a ship before, a big massive cruise ship, she was too short to see over the rail, so she couldn't see. As they got in, to the air of the, they went to the Catalina Islands and they were on this beautiful cruise off the coast of Southern California. It's a beautiful, clear day. The air was so crisp and fresh, you could see for miles. And the little girl said to her dad on tiptoes, I can't see anything. So her father bent down, picked her up, and put her on his shoulders, and he held her feet. And when he stood up with her, she was taller than everybody else on the deck. And for the first time, she was able to look out on the ocean from the perspective of a cruise ship. And you could see nothing. They were in the middle of the ocean in the passage. And the little girl, as children do, expressed something that I hope you will leave this session with. She said, Daddy, Daddy, I can see farther than my eyes can look. I want to talk about vision. That little girl's statement captures the essence of vision. The ability to see farther than your eyes can look. Only by seeing what is not there can you bring something new and creative and exciting into existence? Only by seeing something that is not there. Progress in humanity's journey is only made by people in history who saw things that were not there. Vision is seeing the future before it comes into being. I repeat, vision is seeing the future before it comes into being. I want to live that little girl's statement for the rest of my life. I want to always see farther than my eyes can look. The old woman, Corrie Ten Boone, who wrote the book God's Tramp, a movie we made out of her life, the movie is called The Hiding Place. A great woman who protected the Jews during the Nazi occupation in Poland and other areas. 
They ask the question, how can you be so energetic at age 82? Traveling around the world with your one suitcase, trumping in every country. She was 82 and still traveling and preaching. They said, what's the key to your energy? She said, in a broken Polish language, she said, look down and be oppressed. Look around and be depressed. Look up and be at rest. If you had to live based on what your eyes saw every day, you have a right to be depressed. Vision is a gift from God. I want to first talk a little bit about how vision helps you to make decisions. The greatest gift God ever gave man is the power of choice, the ability to decide, to make decisions. That's the greatest gift God ever gave man. It may also be the greatest curse because it also gave man the power to decide against God. You are not a robot. You are a free moral agent that has the power of a will. It's a gift from God. But secondly, the most dangerous responsibility given by God to man is the same power of choice. If life came with a manual, we would have no problems. You know, when you buy a toaster or a car or a refrigerator or a CD player, isn't it great they got a book in the box? It comes with a manual. Just in case you don't even know how to turn it on, they tell you how to turn it on. They, they show you all the details. They give you instructions. Wouldn't life be great if it came with a manual? doesn't because God gave you a will the most difficult thing in life is having to decide among the alternatives that's the toughest thing in life every day they say everybody makes at least ready for this 7,000 to 10,000 decisions every day the average human makes seven to 10,000 decisions every day. That includes just to open your eyes in the morning. And some of you don't. Clock rings, you reach over, bam, kill the clock. Because it takes a decision to obey the clock. To decide to get up after you open your eyes. How many of you know that when it's cool in the Bahamas with a little bit of draft outside, you, you need a lot of God to come out of the bed? Some of y'all was a little late this morning. I noticed uh, it was a little rough rolling out of there because it takes a decision just to sit up. You know, when I was uh, irresponsible and, and procrastinative in my spirit, I used to actually sit up in the bed and then lay back down. Now, you all never did that. Only me. It takes a decision to even move away from the bed. And I've done that a few times and went back. See, life is filled with them. Decisions. Deciding to go to the bathroom is a decision. Some folks don't bathe, they put on clothes. The decision to bathe is a decision. And then to bathe completely is another decision. Anybody here? See, sometimes you think it's not, it is a decision. In the Bahamas, we got cowboy and Indian. 
<laughs> but the very you know what a cowboy is, right? Y'all do it in Texas too, right? Yeah, cowboy is, you wet the cloth, you wipe your face under your arm, and that's it, out of the house, gone. It takes a decision to take it all off and go in and take the shower. It's a decision to pray in the morning. Most people don't take that decision. It's a decision what to wear. And then you change your mind three times. Life is filled with them. So the problem of life is how do you make decisions among the alternatives? And that's the tough part because we're going to show you today how to minimize your complications. My decisions in life are not difficult. I have fun making decisions because I know how to make decisions. Here's some thoughts I want you to write down. You can get them. Uh, the most challenging task in life is not making decisions, but knowing which decisions to make. True? Yes. Let's put it this way. Everybody, every day, is a decision maker. Even the decision not to decide is a decision. It's impossible not to ever make a decision. Impossible. And so the difficulty in living on earth is deciding what to decide. I have seen people spend their lives wasting time because they made decisions that were not relevant to their pursuit. So here's a comment I want you to remember. and I'm, I'm about to release a new book in the United States. It's going to come out from Vitica Press. The name of the book, title of the book is The Power of Vision. And the publishing company was so excited about the book, they wanted to release it next week at the CBA conference, the Christian Booksellers Association. I told them, no, not yet, because I got some additional chapters in my spirit that the Lord gave me recently, so I withheld the book. Because when you begin to think about the power of this thing called vision, you got to make sure you get it right. And here's a thought. I wanted to put in that book. The reality of life is that you are the sum total of all the decisions you make every day. That's what you are. You are nothing less and nothing more. In essence, you and I become exactly what we decide. That's why it's important to make decisions the right way and make them the right time and make them the right with the right people because whatever you decide becomes your life an alcoholic is a man who decided to take a first drink 25 years ago a chain smoker is a student who is now 80 years old but it was eight when he took his first puff see every decision determines your future Hey boys, say half time. I believe today is half time for some people. You know, when you play games like basketball games and football games, they always have what they call half time. Thank God for half times. You ever seen those teams at half time? They are down, they are losing, and they go into the locker room and they meet with the coach, and the coach makes some adjustments. The coach makes some alternative decisions. And when they come back out, the whole team changes and, and they win. That's the way life is for some of you today. God has made you come to this meeting today to make some adjustments in your life so you don't keep making the same mistakes, the wrong decisions, and end up losing the game of life. Adjustment. Let's talk a little bit about a statement that Paul made. Powerful statement. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12. Make sure you turn to that and underline it in your Bible. It's a verse that really has kept me from a teenager. And it still keeps me today. Here are one of those secrets that your senior pastor is going to give you. This verse 
shall protect you if you understand it it'll keep you it's one of those verses that has in it all of life first Corinthians chapter 6 verse 12 Paul the apostle of the first century church wrote these words I quote everything is permissible for me but not everything is beneficial then he continues everything is permissible for me but I will not be mastered by anything end quote what a statement Paul says anything is permissible that means I can do anything I want I am a free will agent no one can control my life I can decide whatever I want he says but look at the next statement he says but not everything is what beneficial your life should be controlled by what is beneficial now the question of life is how do you know what is beneficial to you that's what vision is all about everybody every day have to deal with what to decide and there's the challenge again what do I decide to do where do I get the foundation for my decision-making well here's what I want to talk to you about vision disciplines you to make decisions correctly the quality of your decisions is determined by the quality of the information that you have and so if you want to make good decisions you got to get what good information if you want to make better decisions you got to get better information in other words your decisions can only be as good as the information you have this is one of the reasons why in this organization and in this ministry I pound so much on knowledge because the more knowledge you get the higher your quality of information to make quality decisions you possess the power to decide whatever you want so therefore you need to make sure that what you know is what you want why is decision making so important because Discipline is created by the power of choice. Discipline is created by what? The power of choice. Paul says, I will do nothing that is not beneficial. Let me define benefit beneficial for you. Benefit is anything that contributes to the fulfillment of your ultimate desire let me repeat please buy this tape very important tape and in a few weeks we'll be saying please buy this CD it's coming praise the Lord <laughs> beneficial means anything that contributes to the fulfillment of your ultimate desire that's beneficial for example if your ultimate desire this year is to lose a hundred pounds that's your desire the first thing you need to do now is have a vision of that desire see yourself in size seven I think <laughs> is that close enough ladies yeah. all right okay now right now you wear uh, 18 or 21 but you have a vision of yourself you see yourself in a seven and that's possible it's possible once you see the vision now you've got to what discipline yourself which means that you got to, watch this now when you go to <sighs> uh, 
cheesecake factory. Or you go to the, the buffet down at Seaside, Bayside, whatever that side is, you all go to down here. And you see all the thousands of choices. Everybody say, help me, Jesus. Yes, sir, you need help when you walk in there. You look at all the three different types of rices. Ten different types of meat. Pork chop, this chop, lamb chop, that chop. Then they got ribs down there. Oh, you should help me. Chicken and ribs. Woo! Fifteen different cakes and a few puddings. I mean, you look at this thing and you go, Lord, I need you. <laughs> now watch this. Watch this. Paul says, Everything is permissible. See, when you pay that fee at the door, <laughs> everything is what? Permissible. Now, never wake up and go into your day without a vision of your future. I said something deep, you missed it. Never enter a restaurant without a vision of the size you want to be. Where there is no vision, the food will perish in your system. The power of vision, man. Before you enter the place, get it in your mind. I see myself. Size seven, right. There's a seven going into this room. <laughs> and when you see that potato salad alongside the slaw, brushing up against the corn and right next to the ribs. That vision rises up and, and says, I am here, size seven. <laughs> and your flesh says, all things are permissible for me to do. But your spirit says, but not all things are beneficial. Clap your hands, you're going to know what I'm standing yeah. Your decisions are totally at the mercy of your vision. And if you have no vision, that's why you keep making dumb decisions. Permissible means you are open season. Beneficial means there's some things you won't permit. It controls your life. This is called discipline. Let me define discipline for you. This is Dr. Miles Monroe's definition of discipline. I read a million books and a thousand definitions, and, but this is the one that I crafted out of the word and out of 35 years of study. Discipline is self-imposed standards and self-imposed restrictions that you put on yourself that are motivated by a desire that is greater than all the alternatives. Now you got to memorize that statement and meditate on it for a minute. What is discipline? Out loud. What is discipline? Discipline is what? Self-imposed standards and restrictions motivated by a desire greater than the alternatives. Do you understand the English? It's a little deep complicated but here's what it means it means discipline is when you police yourself because there's something that you want to achieve that is more important than the other temptations self-discipline is the highest order of living a man or woman who has no self-discipline is guaranteed to fail guaranteed to fail it's self-imposed when a person is not self-disciplined here's a new word to write down they must be other disciplined other discipline if you can't discipline yourself then life has a way of having others discipline you that's why God gave you birth with parents and if you didn't have one you had guardians why did God give you these old people because you see God knows that you have no self-discipline as a child so he needs to give you external discipline until you learn personal discipline and there are people who are 50 years old and still children 
No self-discipline. I see them all the time and I just smile. It takes discipline to go and work on a job for 20 years. Especially with a big dream. That takes discipline. Jesus knew his vision at age 12. He said it to his parents. I must be about my father's business. But then he immediately, the Bible says, next verse says, he went home and submitted to them. And stayed in the house, submitted to his father, worked in the construction company with his daddy for 30 years. That takes discipline when you know your future. Because discipline protects vision. Discipline creates something that you were not born with and the Holy Spirit cannot give you. But that which is necessary for you to succeed. Discipline creates character. It doesn't matter how big your vision is. It will die in the absence of character because character comes from vision when discipline is in action. It takes a lot of discipline to succeed in your vision. Discipline, here's another definition, is decisions dictated by a determined destiny. That's a Miles Monroe original again. What is discipline? Decisions that are dictated by your determined destiny. In other words, once you see a destiny that you are determined to go to, then that controls every decision you make. You decide that my destiny is to be a doctor that serves people. And you are 16 years old. And a young man buys you a ring, $15. He says he loves you and wants to sleep with you at 16. You got some decisions to make. If your destiny is to be that doctor and you are determined to make it there, then your decisions immediately kick in. And they dictate your behavior. And you tell them, I would really like to sleep with you, you know. Because all my friends are doing that. But that decision will not take me to my destiny. It will derail me. And when you refuse him, God calls it discipline. Your friends call it weak. Not in the now. You're not up to date. You're chicken. God calls it what? Discipline. The key to discipline, therefore, is vision. What's the key to discipline? Vision. What's the key to discipline? Vision. Young man, get a vision for your life. If you get a vision for your life, it'll, dis it'll dictate and protect you. I was married as a virgin at age 25. Right here in an island seven miles wide. 21 miles long. Most of my friends had babies before they were 16, 17. I married my wife as a virgin, eh? At age 25. How old are you, young man? Don't answer the question. How old are you, young woman? Was I special? Nope. I was in Bain Town. Oh, you need Jesus to survive Bain Town. <laughs> Everybody kid had a kid. My mother had 10. Children, 11 actually, 
seven girls and a piece of wood <laughs> a broomstick four boys and a club my mother had one statement not my children that was it now other children fine I don't know what they're doing but not I bought you into the world she used to say <laughs> is bound up in the heart of a child and Mrs. Monroe and Mr. Monroe will beat it out and they did a good job look it is out see look no foolishness in this fella clap completely out they beat it out <laughs> you don't counsel it out them boys don't need counseling you don't counsel demon out you roared them out in the name of Jesus. Discipline. Discipline. But the key to discipline is vision. I kept myself because I had a dream. At age 13, I wrote down everything I'm doing right now. Much of what I am doing in my life was on paper at age 13. And that guided me all through high school, all through junior high school, all through the little girlfriend, boyfriend period, every time one of them girls get close to me, I say, bah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I heard that y'all will disrupt me. I want to go somewhere, and I don't want them to stop me. I am permissible to do this, but this is not beneficial to me. I had a vision for my life. I'll tell you something. The greatest gift God ever gave man is not the gift of sight. But the gift of what? Vision. You see, uh, sight is a function of the eyes. But vision is a function of the heart. Sight is a function of the eyes, but vision is a function of the heart. You can have sight and no vision. Most people in the world have sight. Two eyes that look. Because you see, eyes that look are common, but eyes that see are rare. That little girl looking over the rail on that boat, still stirs my heart. Daddy, I can see farther than my eyes can look. This ministry has a vision that has no appearance to what is here now. And we're going to get there. I say we're going to get there. Vision is the source of hope. Vision is the seed of faith. Hallelujah. If your spouse is not born again or not close to God the way you want them to be, let me ask you a question. Do you have an image in your head of what they should look like if they are close to God? And do you see it? And did you write it down? Did you describe your spouse loving God, serving God, on fire for God, coming to worship God with you? Did, do you have the image or you only see what they are? What you're doing sitting down here watching TV? Lazy. Why don't do something? Take the garbage up. You keep seeing what you see. No vision. You need to get an image of your desire. Watch this now. After you get an image of your desire, of your son or your spouse, the way you want them to be, watch this, then the Bible says you must act as if it already is. Now that's interesting. 
comes in drunk, God says, treat him like he's born again. Cook his food. Lay out the table. The Bible says you will win your spouse not by arguing, but by a quiet, obedient spirit. Because you got to act as if they're already there. Now that's interesting. Your boss is irritating and stupid. We know that. God says, see them the way you want them to be. And then work as if they're already like that. That's vision. Jesus saw all of us born again before he even was born. And the Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and the shame. He could handle everything because he had a vision of me and you redeemed and reconciled back to God. He had a vision. He disciplined himself through the cross and the pain because he saw the future. Vision is the foundation, therefore, of courage. Vision makes you persistent. You know, once you know what you want and you can see it, then no matter what comes against you, you maintain your stamina. Your persistence comes from vision. We read a verse this morning, Habakkuk 2. It's a powerful verse. It says, even though the vision seem to tarry, wait for it. It speaks concerning the end of the matter. And it will not lie. It will come to pass. Even though it seemed to what? Tarry. Tarry means, Pastor Miles, I've been talking about this building for years. See, that's your problem. You don't understand how vision go. You got to keep talking till it come. You don't speak and it appears. You got to keep talking. You got to work. Faith without works. Dead faith. I wonder if you could be like the patriarchs in the Old Testament. They had a vision of Christ and never saw him. And the Bible says in the same chapter of Hebrews 11, it says many of them died in hope. Never saw the Christ. But they kept on praying it, kept on prophesying it, kept on saying it, and they died saying it. Can you have that kind of faith? Let me, let me tell you what kind of faith it is. That's faith for your grandchildren. That's right. Oh, Lord have mercy. Faith comes from a vision that you might never see come past, but you know your grandkids are going to bring it to pass because you said it so strongly. I suggest to you that God has some tremendous plans for us that no one else can do. God gave man the ability of visions so he would not have to live by what he sees. I hope you can write this down. This is very important. This is very important. I said this is a very important principle. God gave you and I the gift of vision. So that we don't have to live by what we see. Man, I'm so glad. Aren't you? You see, because vision gives you the ability to look at something and see something else. That's a gift. I say that's a gift. True visionaries are paradoxical people they are usually called insane you are looking at one of them why are true visionaries paradoxical people because the imaginary world of their vision is more real to them than the solid reality all around them Matter of fact, 
to a visionary. His vision is his reality. And that makes him a paradox. Anybody ever been to Disney World before? Yeah, Walt Disney was sitting on a bench when Disney World had just opened. And Walt was sitting on this bench out in the bush, just trees, and he, they only had the one little thing built over there, a little ride over there. And he was just staring out in the open in space. One of his workers who was manicuring the grass came by and says, Mr. Disney, how are you, sir? And he says, fine. And he kept on staring, didn't look at the guy. And the guy says, uh, Mr. Disney, what are you doing? He says, I'm looking at my mountain. He says, I see that mountain right there. Mr. Walt Disney died. But before he died, he told his architects about this mountain he saw. And he just told them, he kept talking, and they kept writing, and he talked, and they wrote, and then they drew it, and he died. Never saw it. When they were about to dedicate Space Mountain, the governor was present, the mayor was present, the place was packed. His wife was sitting there, a widow. One of the young men stood up to introduce her and said, it's a pity today, how sad, that Mr. Walt Disney is not here to see this mountain. <laughs> but his wife is here. And we're glad that she's here. Old lady walked up to the podium, looked at the crowd, and said, I must correct the young man. You just saw the mountain. You see, a visionary is a crazy person. They believe more in what you cannot see than what you see. I walk in that leadership institute every day. Many will come and go and leave me. But I tell you, we will walk in there. We will cut a ribbon and you will see it. It already exists. I see thousands come into the Bahamas, thousands upon thousands, to learn how to lead with excellence. I see it. Amen. You see a church. I don't see a church. I see a community of leaders who are demonstration prototypes of what leadership is on. That's why this church will be filled with millionaires. Everybody will either be a millionaire or close. Why? Because you, you got to be a demonstration. Your success is inevitable. God have to make you succeed. The call on this ministry demands that you learn the principles of discipline and development and success. You have to. Because you cannot preach what you are not. Everybody cannot come to this church, and I don't want everybody here. I'm looking for no big church. Christ had 12, and he kept them. That's all he wanted was 12. He lost one. He was not after volume. He was after value. Great groups never change the world. Always the few with vision, hey? Tell your neighbor, you can't see what I see. But if you saw what I saw, you would shake my hands right now.
Go ahead, shake the hand right now. Some of you are sitting in this room, sitting on a bench, staring in the distance. Anybody sitting on a bench? All those sitting on the bench, let me see your hands. Say, Lord, I see it. See, once you see it, then it controls your life. This statement is very interesting to me. Vision is the capacity to believe what you cannot see and prepare and plan for it. <laughs> Vision is the capacity to believe in what others cannot see physically with your eyes, but you start planning and preparing for it now. You don't wait till it comes to prepare. Write this down. Preparation is proof of belief. Preparation is proof of belief. You do not believe until you prepare. I don't care what you tell me about what you're thinking about. Until you prepare for it, you don't believe it. Write this down. Preparation is the highest act of faith. Preparation is what? The highest act of faith. When you believe something, you prove it by preparing for it. That's why you prepare yourself with education. Because you got a vision of something. That's why God is telling some of you to go back to evening school. Because your dream demands some more information. Sometimes you got to prepare by changing your friends. Because them ones you with, they ain't going nowhere and they want you to go with them. Have you ever made a resolution like this, New Year's resolution? I will change my friends. I did. I changed my friends years ago. I said, man, these people ain't going nowhere. So I changed my friends. Because your association determines your destination. Your associations determine your destination. That's why vision is so powerful. It disciplines everything in your life. You got to be with people who think big if you want to do big things. Say amen. Let me tell you something. Nothing is worse than an optimist keeping friends with a pessimist. That's, right. That's a formula for depression. <laughs> you don't want to be with anybody else in your past who ain't going to a future, brother. It's okay to leave losers. Well, ever since you started going to BFM, you don't come around us no more. That's true. Yes. That's supposed to happen. Well, ever since you started going to that place and that man teaching that funny thing, you don't talk to us no more. You don't even come around the family much no more. That's right. You can't go up by going down. Y'all ain't listening to me. You can't move forward by going backward. Them folks, ain't, they, they, they got all kind of weights on their legs. They got chain with a ball on it. And they want you to wear yours too. Tell your neighbor, cut your chain today. You got to leave them people in mind. That's why I love eagles, boy. Eagles don't flock. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Eagles ain't no pigeons. Pigeons flock. That's why they never fly high. Always in a group. Eagles all by themselves. That's why they're called the eagle of vision. They could see better than any other bird because their perspective is the highest.
Tell your neighbor, I hope you are an eagle. Or take your pigeon somewhere else. You don't want to hang around people who ain't going nowhere. Praise God. And remember this. You become what you keep hearing. Some of you all don't like me, but at least listen to what I'm saying. Because I know what I'm saying is good. Because I believe it myself. You become what you consume. Big thinkers produce big visions. That's what we need. Nothing has ever been done worthwhile by a pessimist. Nothing. A negative person has never changed the world. It's always the man or woman who could see more than their eyes could look. They're the ones that change the world. Tell your neighbor, I see something. And it looks better than what I see now. Aren't you glad God gave you vision? The house you live in ain't the one you see. So you can tell your house when you go back home, you are temporary. Hello? The car you go into in the parking lot. I want you to walk out there talking to the car. Tell the car, you ain't what I saw. So you definitely just passing through. Clap your hands and thank God. Use your faith. Be it unto me just like he said it. In the name of Jesus. What do you see? Is it big? Nothing has ever been done without vision. Nothing. The old woman, Helen Keller, she was born blind, born blind. Never saw anything. Born blind, deaf, dumb. Helen Keller learned to read Braille. Helen Keller wrote poetry that became Nobel Peace Prize quality. She became a sought after leader. She gave us speeches by writing on paper and showing the people and then write and show. This woman was sought out. She was paid honorariums and couldn't talk. How much mouth do you have? Walter Cronkite was interviewing her one day. Old woman, almost 80 years old, shaky, Helen Keller. He put a mic in her face. And he said, Miss Keller, she couldn't talk now. Miss Keller, what could be worse than being blind all your life? She picked up a pencil and she wrote an answer. And she showed it to him. And the answer was being born with eyes but no vision. Some of y'all got four eyes, you got glasses. <laughs> and you still ain't progressive. That's right. She had no eyes and became a world leader. Because you don't need eyes to have vision. Today, God has sent me into your life to stir up something that your eyes cannot see. Vision. A couple of comments on vision. Write this down. It is said that the poorest man in the world is not a man without money. It's a man without vision. Famous verse, King Solomon. Proverbs 29, verse 13. I think... It would be important for you to read this with me because I don't want you to miss this interesting revelation. Please get your Bibles and turn me to the book of Proverbs. I want to read this. Allow me to read this, please, with you. 
Proverbs chapter 29, verse 13. Uh, before we read that, can you please go to Proverbs chapter 22? Proverbs chapter 22. When I first read this verse, I became mad at God. Angry at God. Matter of fact, I became so angry. I was tempted to curse God. This verse. Let me read it with you. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 2. Let's read it together out loud. The rich and the poor have this in common. What is it? The Lord is the maker of them all. Now that made me angry. Because when I read that, I was in Bain Town. Think about the verse. Bain Town, my son, are you a visitor? Let me tell you, Bain Town is like one of the low income areas of our country. Maybe in your country you call them the ghettos, eh? I read this in a house made of wood on four stones. I read that. Read it again. Imagine, you're sleeping on the floor in a wooden house with mosquitoes and rats, and you read this. The rich and the poor have one thing in common. God made both of them. I mean, that can make you mad, because you are the poor one. So my first thought was, wait a minute. God made Kellys and God made Monroes. God made the Kellys rich and the Monroes poor. This God cannot be fair. And then I went to race, and I really got mad then. I said, okay, so God made poor people, God made rich people. So if you're poor, God made you that way. And if you're rich, God made you that way. Therefore, that's your destiny, to be poor. That's depressing. I became angry at God. I was about to curse God, and God says, you only read half of the story. Read the rest of the story. I was reading this whole book, you see, teenager, reading this book. And I kept reading, and I kept reading. When I got to chapter 29, it appeared again. But this time, God completed the sentence. Let's read it. Chapter 29, verse 13. The poor man and the rich man have this in common. Underline it. The Lord gives sight to the eyes of both. I rest my case. Here's the way it's written in the Hebrew language. God creates all men. Some become rich. Some become poor depending on how they see. That's what that means. Make a clap. Your vision determines your future. What you see determines what you become. A wealthy man is not better than you. He just sees differently. Two college students went to visit India, Bombay, took off time from college that summer, got their backpack, a couple of blue jeans and a t-shirt, didn't have no money, saved up enough money from their jobs to take a trip, one trip to India. Their dream was to go to India, travel over the, 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 the Indian nation. And they went and they caught these trains and they were, they were sleeping in hostels and, and they went across the big cities of Bombay and Calcutta. And, and when they went to Calcutta, they saw something they never could forget. Two young men, all the way from the west coast of the United States, cut off jeans, t-shirt, on an adventure. And they came into Calcutta, and there were millions of people. I mean, India is the second largest country in the world. That's where they went. Today, they got one billion people. One billion. You can't imagine that as a Bahamian. We got 300,000. We don't know what we're talking about. One billion people in one country. 
Yeah, Canada alone is almost 50 to 60 million people in one city. They are sleeping on top of each other. They are living in the streets. They are in poverty because the government cannot handle the pressure for the social demands. And so the people got to sleep in mud. They got to build their houses out of, of pieces of paper and cardboard and tin. And they got to go and, 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 and steal trash to, to, to make their rugs and their beds. I mean, it's filth. And these young men saw this and they came to the city and they, they couldn't believe what they saw. They came to the train and there were just thousands of people in the streets sleeping on the ground, man. Flies everywhere. People with, with all kinds of disease. Sleeping in the mud, nowhere to sleep. And they saw them in the morning get up and they like a big horde of animals just, just going to this market and then going to the next market. Everyone's just trying to find, begging and trying to make a living. And one of the young men said, wow, man, look at the people, dirty feet, filthy people, thousands of dirty feet, no shoes. His other friend looked at the same people and says, wow. What an opportunity for a shoe business. So his friend Tom came back to the United States. They got back, went back to college. Tom couldn't get what he saw out of his head. He sat down in his classroom and designed a shoe, a plastic shoe. He wanted something that could be very easily purchased and cheap. And he designed a shoe and took it, got it patented, and went to one of his friends who knew a manufacturer and says, can you let your manufacturer friend see this? I believe that we could really do something for the people in India. And his friend took it and the guy made a prototype of this plastic shoe. And he said, it works. And so he said, would you be willing to export this to India? The manufacturer says, sure, you get marketing, we get business. It costs us 15 cents to make the shoe. We sell it for $2. No problem. So they started exporting shoe to India. This young guy. This young man dropped out of school, man. Started pumping his business. Shoes took off, exploded. He sold 100,000 the first year, 300,000 the second year. By the fifth year, he was selling millions. He became a multi-millionaire. His name is Tom. We call him Tom McCann. Now you just buy his shoe. The guy who went to India with him is trying to pay his mortgage off. What? They saw the same thing. Or did they? Ah. Write this down. Every problem is a business. Some people are looking for jobs. You don't need no job. You need a vision. Walk around. Get out of bed. Don't be stupid and lazy. Get out of bed and walk around. Some folks sit around waiting for a job. Go look for a problem. Let me tell you right now. My car dirty. That's a problem. A lot of cars are dirty. That's a problem. Open a business. Five dollars for a bucket. Two dollars for a sponge. 395 for joy lotion, dishwashing lotion. Start your business. Stop looking for a job. Find a problem. Hey, boy, say vision. The Bahamas is filled with businesses, and we pass them by every day. It's filled with businesses, folks. Look at your community, find a problem. How do you see vision? As soon as 9-11 took place, believe me, dreamers went into action. They didn't panic. They went into thinking. They're the ones who make the millions. They decide they're going to create some new screening machines. Somebody figured that out, eh? 
Somebody said, okay, we got to create some new security training companies. Someone got to think that up. Hmm? Cuba opening is not a problem. It's a business opportunity. Imagine the world without Castro and then start preparing. Come on, Bahamians, talk to me. You got a plan. What the 10 things may happen after Castro died? The 10 things. And pick out three and make them your future. You don't panic, you plan. You don't panic, you prepare. You don't panic, you plan. When the economic boom fell out in the United States, everybody thought, oh boy, poverty is going to sweep the U.S. in the 1930s. Eh? Do you know who became the millionaires during that time? <laughs> the doctors, the psychologists, and the motivational speakers. Because when people are depressed, they need someone to cheer them up. You all don't understand. So you call it... <laughs> economic downturn. No, it's an opportunity for new businesses. But only those with vision can see that far. That young man didn't see bare feet. He saw a shoe industry. Can I hear an amen? amen. Some of you need to be smart. If I was, if I had the time, if I, if I wasn't already on a track with my vision here in this ministry, I would have started a horse farm. A horse farm, that's right. Just to grow horse tail. <laughs> see, you see, you see, you see, you, see you, you, you ain't got no vision. All you're doing is buying the tail. You ain't thinking about producing the tail. Clap your hands. You need vision, man. <laughs> you see where they're going, so go for it. Buy a horse farm. Say amen, somebody. Everybody say, boy, pastor got vision now. Yeah, you, you check where they're headed and prepare for them. Have vision. Lord, have mercy. And things so tough, I promise you, you'll never be out of business. Never be out of business. Not be here, will always be here. All right. Let me, let me close. I got to finish this next week. Can I finish this next week? Are you happy you came here today? Yeah. Let me finish this, this couple of thoughts and we're going to close because I don't want to keep you. Your vision determines your destiny and therefore you need to make sure your vision is correct. I want to give you a definition. I want to read a scripture and then we're going to close. Here's a definition of vision. What is vision? What did, these young, what, what, what did this young man see? What made him so different? Here's what it is. Vision is an internalized, clear mental image of a preferable future. That's what a vision is. Here's the future I prefer. You see it. You see it. This preferred future is a result of God imparting through inspiration to your spirit man. That's why vision is really from the spirit to the heart of man. God never deals with the present because the present to God is already history. God always deals with the future. He imparts the future to the present so the present will not be depressed. Do you know what a promise is? We always talk about the promises of God. A promise is the future being told to the present. That's a promise. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says the promises of God are all yea and amen. 
In other words, God always tells you about your future and it's better than the past and the present. And he wants you to live not on the present. He wants you to live on the future. Right now you are broke. That's the present. Don't live in that. Otherwise you'll be broke. <laughs> Live on the promise, my God shall supply all of my needs, which means that my present got to be temporary. So I'm not, I'm not broke, it's just that my money ain't arrived yet. See, a, vision, a visionary never sees pessimistic vision. Amen. They always see optimistic reality. They always say, well, it ain't here yet, that's all. And so they act like it's coming. <laughs> oh hallelujah you know God is a is a preparation God I always think about God God lives exactly what he preaches to us you know what God did let me ask you a question why God couldn't just send Jesus without John the Baptist you never think about these things right because God understands vision he says, I will send you one before my face, and he will prepare the way. Why does God need a preparation process? Why does he need a preparer? Because a preparer always brings faith. I want you to leave this place and tell all your friends at work tomorrow. There cometh a house after my first one that is greater than my first one. Let me say it again. You miss me. There cometh a business after this one that is greater than the one I have. In other words, speak like John. There cometh one after me. It's another me now. <laughs> oh, talking to myself. There cometh another miles that is greater than this one. So don't judge this one yet. There cometh another greater than who you are now and it's the other you that you see that no one else can see the voice of God is telling you live with vision my daughter don't give up because what you got ain't what he showed you what you are is not what he showed you. How many of you single people see yourself married? Let me see uh, You sure? I think you need to go sit down today and write out details. This is the kind of wife I want. This is the kind of shape she should have. This is the kind of tongue she should have. Lip, hip. Give God something to work with, man. I want a spouse. He said, you're a 1,500 pound woman. Yeah, boom. God says, you didn't ask me about details. <laughs> you shall have whatever you say. And if you don't say nothing, God give you anything. Got to have a vision. I say, you got to have a vision. That's why in this ministry, I keep giving you details of our future. This last statement, vision is a visual reality of your purpose for existence. Next week, going to be real exciting, so please don't miss it. Vision is foresight with insight based on hindsight. In other words, God always shows you where you come from. Then he shows you where you are, but he also shows you where you're going, eh? And then he says, forgetting those things that are behind. In the present, I press toward the mark of what? Not just a calling. <laughs> it's higher one. It's a better future for us. Turn to the scripture I want to, want to close with. Hebrews chapter 11. Oh, we can deal with that next week. We'll put that back. 
Are you glad you came over here today? Yeah. Tell your neighbor, I could see better now. I could see farther than my eyes could look. Come on, say it. I can see farther than my eyes can look. And that's what God wants you to do. Your future is so exciting, I can't wait to get there. Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 6. Read it out loud, please. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is what? Impossible to please God. Now read verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Praise God. What is faith? Substance of things you are hoping to accomplish and it's evidence of things that, that you can't show nobody because they can't see it yet. Now let me say something very quickly. Faith, therefore, is substance of which you cannot see with your eyes. Yes. Stay with me here. Stop living by sight. The just shall live by faith. Faith is seeing the unseen. The just shall live by faith. For we walk by faith and not by sight. What is sight? The eyes. What is faith? Vision. Hallelujah. Now here's why I want to close on this. Verse 6 is a mind blower. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without what? Faith. What is faith? Faith is seeing the unseen. If you deal with God by what your eyes can see, you displease God. How many of you want to please God? Let me see hands. You want to please God? This week? You want to please God? Okay. God tells you how to please Him. He said, don't ever come to me with what is. And you'll please me. Keep showing me what others can't see yet. When you please God, He gives you everything you need. That's why God doesn't like the past. He forgets it. He's not a God of past. He's the God of faith. If you show God something that no one else could believe, you excite God. Hallelujah. After you show God what others cannot see, then God makes a promise. He is a what? A rewarder. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, what kind of rewarder is God? Let me tell you what kind of rewarder he is. God says, look, if you bring stuff to me that no one has ever seen physically, and you believe them, you please me, then I'll reward you. How am I going to reward you? Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him. Who is able to do not what you think, not what you dream, not what you ask for, but to do above and beyond, exceedingly above, beyond all that you can ever ask or think or imagine according to the power that's working inside of you, God says. Praise God. I say praise God.